Welcome to Screen Therapy. I'm your host, Jason Schurz. In October of 2018, I found myself in the hospital, sitting across from a psychiatrist who was telling me that I was bipolar. I was released with a bunch of medication and laid on the couch for about a week. I had my iTunes library on shuffle, trying to shake the hornet's nest from my head. Ever since I was a kid, I've been using music for therapy and as a way to escape. Punk rock and mental health have always been connected. This podcast looks at that connection through the lens of different guests. This is Screen Therapy. First of all, Christy C. Road legally changed her name to the title of a Green Day song. How cool is that? Christy is a Cuban-American artist, writer, and musician. Her involvement in the punk and feminist scenes has been a part of her healing from sexual trauma. Her latest music project is called Choked Up, a pop-punk band based in New York. Christy is also the author of three graphic novels about trauma, survival, and love. As a survivor of partner abuse, she's become well aware of how trauma is connected to her mental health. Hi, this is Christy Road, and here I am at Scream Therapy. It's a good name for the show, but it's a name I would use to identify my entire life and my entire uh, relationship to punk. Punk was Scream Therapy for me. I connected to punk in 1994, but it, it was around the very early 90s, late 80s, that I was drawn to rock music as this outlet of stress and anger. And I didn't really know where I fit in because there wasn't like women being represented. It wasn't just my awkwardness, but just my experience and my own relationship to my sexuality and not knowing if I'm queer or what or who I am. You know, I'm about 11, 12 in this era that I'm talking about or 10. I feel like I I became old and sad when I was nine. So I think that um, mental health being a focus and something I'm thinking about and something I'm trying to deal with just started when I was very young and finding these outlets of anger and rage were always so important to me. I think that there was a huge difference between punk rock and heavy metal and horror movies. I think that the punk rock that I found, particularly Green Day at first, but then Crimp Shrine and, and Bikini Kill and just these bands that were talking about their mental health and their problems with the system and with patriarchy and with abuse and all these things that require, you know, screen therapy and healing. And so um, that's kind of what punk rock was to me when I first became really connected. And I heard of Bay Area scene and bands like Blatz and Pansy Division and Op Ivy and just these bands that were discussing racism, classism, feminism. And I was just impacted by a lot of that stuff. I'm Cuban American. I'm first generation. I grew up in Miami. My whole life, I was just wanting to hold down my culture and my family and my existence like that. But there was so much um, homophobia and and sexism and machismo. And just, I just felt very silenced in a lot of places at school, just out in the world and being like this young, weird, butch teen that was discovering punk rock. It wasn't fashionable back then. It was awkward and stressful for people. They were like, oh God, you know, she's got to look like a freak now. How inconvenient. But I didn't care. So I just felt very empowered to just use that um, and use punk rock and use that whole new community that I was really, really um, committed to finding and committed to connecting with. And you got into writing zines as well. Yeah, I think that wanting to participate in punk rock and uh, came next. What started in the beginning was just more like this is a home and this is this is a place where I can breathe and live and exist And then wanting to participate, it came fairly fast. I I, I always wanted to participate in everything I I love. I started my zine. It was all about Green Day in the beginning. It was called the Green Zine. 
I picked up the Lookout Records zine. It was available at my independent record shop. It was just this place that I, I would go. And sometimes I wouldn't buy anything, but it was like, this is the life I want. This is where I can find freaks and, and safety, you know, a place to just grow as myself. Yeah, and then and I got Comet Bus zine and I got Bikini Kill zines and just all these zines that were around during that time and available at the indie record store. Just kind of discovering mail order and connecting with people at Lookout Records and I made pen pals with Rob Vasquez who was in the Peaches and it was cool because it was folks of color in the in the scene and it wasn't even something I thought about often because I was in Miami where I had a big community of my culture, Latinx community and Cuban community and just really close to black communities and just different cultures. Miami is full of all kinds of people, but it being black and brown was a big deal for me to feel safe there and for me to feel like, you know, that's one problem I didn't have to deal with. Even though there was white supremacy and racism in Miami, it's in Latinx communities, it's so obvious and so terrible. But just punk being diverse was very magical for me. And so, you know, listening to these bands, I was like, oh, you know, I would love more people of color, but I just so happened to have discovered, you know, Green Day and Op Ivy and and like the Ramones way before all of them and, and just all these bands that were white folks. And it was inspiring, but it was also like, all right, I need my culture. So it was nice to have this pen pal. And Rob was actually the first person who told me that I should start a zine. He actually got me into Bikini Kill and all of the, because he was in that scene in the Peaches and stuff. He just told me about all these things that I needed to write about. And I'm just like, whatever, I'm going to write a zine about Green Day. And because I hated the whole sellout argument that I thought was classist. But yeah, I was just kind of obsessed with proving the world wrong and making everyone appreciate Green Day. I loved them so much and I still do. And and so the zine started around 1997. It was cool because I, I wrote more about my feelings about punk ethics and then my feelings about the internal problems with homophobia. It always had like a Green Day theme. There was an article about homophobia in my scene, just how much my looming mental health and like becoming more depressed and becoming more anxious. How was that affected by school? You know, I was in this world every day and like, this interaction with the outside world. And just because you're in school, just because it's a teacher, just, you know, doesn't mean that you can't like call out their sexism or call out their homophobia. I wrote a book about it eventually called Spit and Passion. So yeah, punk was always this place to have that. And my zine just needed to tell all those stories and talk about all that stuff. But the zine just kind of progressed to be more personal and it was really healing. You were a big part of the Bay Area punk scene. It seems like it was a beacon for you, something that you could look towards. Yeah, absolutely. And the more involved I got, the more I would see these little internal battles within the scene. And I was so excited to have this diverse, you know, scene, have a lot of women and queer folks that were like in my life and like supporting me and punks. And, you know, we were all friends. But I, I felt like the more I would lean towards my political values and my more politicized identity, the more friends I would lose. And they'd be like, oh, you know, we're going to the Pennywise show. You can go have fun at the Food Not Bombs Benefit Loser. Back in the day, it was so dramatic. I just felt like the second I started talking about more difficult stuff, but particularly healing from sexual violence and healing from sexual assault, that was when it was very clear what scenes didn't want to hear from me. And what bands were just like, oh, this rhetoric again, you know, um, but yeah, when it comes to like, we don't want to deal with your narrative, that's kind of what has affected my mental health through the years. It's like extra isolating to just be alone with your trauma and be alone with your narratives on structural racism and sexual violence. I just felt specifically those were the things people didn't want to talk about when I really needed to talk about them. And I still need to talk about them. I'm wondering how you dealt with your own abuse. I am. Um, Every experience is so different how it affects us throughout our life. And I, and I think that I definitely discredited mine because it was partner abuse. The times that happened when I was 18, 19, and then 20, it, it wasn't even these dynamics. You know, sometimes there was like age, different, big age differences. Sometimes there was the dynamic within people's power in the scene. 
and people's power in the relationship, it always was painful and terrible. And I felt like I did spend a long time ignoring what had happened because it felt easier to just, I I remember the day after this terrible experience happened and the experience happened on a date that was the most, one of my favorite dates ever in the beginning. We went to a Go-Go's concert and that was so fucking awesome. And I just, I do credit this disconnect I had from power pop and from, from just like apolitical poppy pop punk, like Mr. T experience. And, and I love that. I still love it. I always loved it. And I, I didn't even, I didn't associate it with abuse, even though, so many 80s power pop bands have shady ass lyrics. But at the same time, I love that music. And there was, and the Go Go's were fucking awesome. And I, ident- I still identify with so many of their lyrics. And to just not be able to listen to the Go Go's anymore because of some asshole, that just really pissed me off. But that's what I did for a long time. I was just kind of like, all this music was triggering to me all of a sudden. But I still would wear like my Elvis Costello shirt everywhere. And this is when I was 19, 18, 19. And I hadn't found the super feminist punk rock anarchist communities yet. But I had badass feminist friends. And I had, I don't know, I just feel like I had women in my life. And I had people listening, you know, and people believing me. I felt like that was all I needed. I have friends that believe me and listen to me. And we've been drinking about it and yelling about it. You just got to like live your life and focus on your life and heal in these other ways and but it wasn't working because it was there's just so much more to sexual trauma that is about just completely losing agency over your body and over your growth losing agency over your sexuality so I did just get more into the feminist community just so I can have these conversations and I just started hanging out with really badass activists more so than my pop punk friends who were not really listening to politicized bands or having politicized conversations. Not that it's bad. I'm just like, you know, if that's what you need at the time, like not have intense political conversations all the time. I really wanted to respect my friends. They were all people of color or they were survivors themselves. I feel like I had a lot of survivor friends and we both healed in a like, let's drink and like curse this guy and then just forget about it and live our lives and write our zines about bands and interview bands. But I feel like those friendships drifted apart because I wanted accountability. I wanted these other things that I knew would help me heal. And then not receiving accountability led to this new era of healing and mental health breakdowns. And the thing that happened to me that kind of allowed this healing, like I did heal a lot even before the feminist scenes because I had, like I said, I had badass friends who were listening I didn't, I I got into a relationship right during that time as I was connecting more to feminist scenes. And I started dating this person who ended up being just the most coercive, fucked up relationship that included these moments of sexual coercion and a lot of body shaming. And that relationship fucked me up. I wrote a book about it. It's called Bad Habits. And I wrote that book years after it happened. But when it happened, I didn't know how it was affecting me. And it was just a very long time of being constantly telling myself, well, I'm in the feminist community. This isn't happening. I'm in the feminist community. We're radical feminists. This totally isn't happening. And just kind of eventually realizing that it is happening because this person hurt a lot of women in our community and and non-binary folks. And it was really terrifying and I it's fucked up because it shaped my work and what I write about and how I take up space. I feel like the more I healed from this trauma, the more I, I wrote about it in my zine, which came out two years after the relationship. So, you know, I feel like I was just so entrenched in this feminist community where there was dialogue. I felt like I was healing in this really important way, but because of other aspects in my life, like my mental health, my individual needs versus the way that um, in a lot of collective community healing, 
it kind of almost feels like there's a right way to be a survivor versus the wrong messy way. And I was the wrong messy way. I wanted cocaine and the nightclubs and parties. I wanted to rage all the time. And what I noticed was being more in the more activist and academic feeling settings of healing from abuse. I felt like I couldn't fall apart and I needed to fall apart. And then it was also this thing where like I needed also to like figure out who I was as as an artist. And I think elevating my mental health and my actual health took a back seat because I was so focused on like healing my spirit and healing my genitalia and fucking people again and loving people again. And like, I was just so enamored by like healing through love and sex I focused on that for a very long time and I'm very proud of the work I did. I wrote Bad Habits. Bad Habits is all about losing the connection to my sex organs and and penetration and this personal relationship with sex and then also love and not believing in any of it and not having any of it. And the book ends with this time I masturbated and I was like, oh my God, I healed. I had penetration and it was all me. I don't need love or humans or people. Fuck all y'all. I just think it's so important to acknowledge the communities that save you, the self-love that saves you, and not constantly look for a new partner to save you. And I and that's what I was doing forever. And I and I continue to do it after the release of the book because we can't be our own best therapists. What role does being in bands like Choked Up play in your healing? It's funny, I was about to get to that because after or while writing bad habits and while writing about all this stuff and looking for love obsessively, I started my band, The Home Wreckers, in 2000. And, this is 2008. Having The Home Wreckers, it was my first taste. Because I had bands before that, but they weren't, you know, we're planning these songs and we're planning this tour and we're like, we have future plans. And there's just something about having like a stable, committed band that to me filled that role of love. That was just so healing. It was just, that was just such a magical time. I don't know. I I just felt like I had finally merged these scenes that I was talking about earlier that always just felt like this division where I could not have my narrative as as a survivor, but suddenly I could. Suddenly these apolitical bands wanted to listen and and were respecting um, the things that I had to say and like proud that I was saying these things. And these were people coming from the woodwork who I'd known for 20 years who were just not available during different times, but then suddenly we're like, you know, these are important ideals. Things kind of did fall apart scene wise overall, but I just felt like there were so many bands and so many people in the community that were still taking up space and doing cool stuff at In Sub Fest, at the Fest, at Awesome Fest, bands like The Measure and Warriors. It was The Measure back then. City Mouse and just all these badass women and queer folks doing badass stuff and like guys that had power in the scene editing their approach to um, creating spaces and creating festivals and having diverse rosters. And I don't know, I just felt like there was really cool stuff happening around 2010, um, 2009. And I was so excited to be in, in the home records at the time. The home records were like eight years of this relationship. And just in this band, we eventually became all queer members and the whole band became this best friend obsession kind of unit. A lot of stuff in my life, relationship drama particularly, and then difficult things happening in my family and difficult things happening in my community with other people's drama, friends causing harm, friends causing each other harm and wanting to be there for both of them and wanting to be there for everyone and not being there for myself caused this rift between me and punk and everything I loved. That happened around 2010, 11, because my bandmate who I had dated left the band and I was just broken up by the breakup, but it brought up everything that was about the abusive relationship from 2002, from back in the day, the long-term one, So I just kind of realized like, all right, having a family is not going to heal trauma because trauma rears its head every time. Well, every time I have a breakup, every time I have a fight, every, so just 
I needed the homewrecker so bad, but then we decided to take a break, and I was like, no! What do I do? I need pop punk to heal me. But then I realized, like, pop punk is actually making me sad. I missed an entire Green Day album release, which is, I always look back, and I'm so sad about it. And I'm like, oh, my God, I would have done this. I would have worn this outfit to the shows. I would have done this and this and this. But I did it because I was sad. And I was so broken by losing this community that I I was watching like the queer punk scene that we had built just kind of slowly um, disintegrate. And it was so painful. But then around 2012, 2013, the home records picked it back up and we like started doing our thing again. When you're playing with Choked Up, how does it make you feel? Um, so so I, I have all these intense feelings about Choked Up because two of the members parted ways and are focusing on their projects. And I don't know, I stopped thinking about playing music, but it still fills just that void that you get when you are traumatized or when you are depressed or when you are anxious. I feel like it's filled and cured with music and with having a band. Touring was always the most healing thing for me. My mental health becomes really stable on tour unless if I deal with some difficult thing. And, and what I noticed with the last two choked up tours was I was like two in my head and not on the tour, you know? I just started thinking about how in the last five years, my usual, you know, relationships, uh, having band members, having a band and touring were always the thing that I would go to that would just kind of like rearrange my mental health and put me back on track. But none of that stuff seemed to be working anymore over the last two years. Or none of that stuff seemed to be working in the way that I was doing it anymore. And I really needed to, you know, figure out a way. And a lot of people in my life have different ways of doing things. I think that medications or different practices or health practices or treatments you know, are totally amazing and have changed so many people's lives. But we all need to do what is best for us. And we all need to understand what that is. And for me, it's digging into the core of what is hurting and making art about it and making music about it. And right, you know, and I think that I had no idea what was hurting my core these last five years until recently and it was so much about the abusive relationship. It was so much about this inability to see myself as a grown up, to see myself as the artist other people see. I learned to not compartmentalize my projects. Like just because I published a tarot deck, it doesn't mean I'm like different than the person who published, you know, graphic memoirs about punk. I just think that it's the same person, but just with more and offering more and more aware of herself. But it was easy to say that, and it's easy for other people to see that, but I did not. I could not see the value in my work. And it was just really, like, I noticed that back in the day I would tour and I would create these little families. And the little the family essence is kind of what was healing for me. But the older I get, the more I'm like, I have to feel that love and that healing vibe from... Um, my work. It can't just be other people. Just having ba a band and going on tour wasn't enough. Like I was still very depressed and I was still unable to enjoy the things in my life that were fun. I started connecting um, to my ancestral magic and working on my tarot card deck, which is my most recent um, release. And like doing all this healing that was beyond punk, um, that are ancestral, that are indigenous, and that came before capitalism. And I think if we really want to smash capitalism, we really have to elevate these conversations that were not happening in punk. And punks don't like talking about spirituality. I, did, I thought it was weird until I got a tarot card reading when I was 19. And this woman just turned me out. And I was just like, all right, well, this is why feminist punks are witches. And this is why goth feminists and why punk feminists and why, you know, like why all of the like queer and women punks in the 90s were like kind of witchy. But I was not. I was like, give me my, you know, give me my, um, my, my beer and my pop punk 
and some Ramones records and just, I, I don't want to talk about spirituality. I don't want to connect to that. But with time, I just realized it was so much about my internalized issues with not connecting to my queerness, my gender, my magic, my contributions to the world and seeing them in a way other than entertainment. I've gotten all these letters from people telling me that my graphic novels have helped them heal and help them, you know, and also make choices like run away from their abusive home, run away from their abusive relationship. And that's so meaningful to me. And that's so like, that's why I do this. That's why I've never even really cared about how much money I'm making and why I hate social media because it forces us to see our careers via followers and likes and blah, 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 blah. That's not how it was back in the day. Back in the day, we just needed one good review and then we're fine for the year. And as far as feeling good about creating the new thing, all I needed was community and support and friends and love and like an exchange of the work. And I just think that reconnecting to that love of making work and seeing the value in the work that I make and the work that I give required this moment of connecting to ancestral magic and connecting to like deeper relationships with my culture and with my family and with my ancestors and just with the fact that like I'm first generation Cuban and I grew up around all of this African diaspora magic and Catholicism, but the Catholicism was all I got to know about because society just kind of shuns African ancestral magic and Latinx society, Latinx white supremacy. Like it's so obvious how like all of these indigenous and African ideals are erased from our spirituality. And it's total bullshit. You know, I did what my ancestral magic equivalent to a treatment would be. And I did just a lot of rituals and a lot of self-medicating, just like shock therapy, like take it out. What is causing me to be so sad all the time and not enjoy positive things coming my way? I just think it's a happy ending for depressed people who don't want to rely on other humans. I think in order for me to even give a crap about working with other people, I needed to do my solo project and enjoy it and feel life from it. And now I'm excited about working with other people and developing Choked Up, but it doesn't feel like the end all like it used to. Having bandmates just felt like what was going to cure me. Whereas now I'm creating my music and the fact that I'm putting this art into the world is what is giving me life. And I think that it's important to have bandmates who give you life and have relationships that give you life. But if that's all that's giving you life, it wore me down and it just really made me extra depressed and extra disembodied. Kind of milking the solo project and developing a new relationship with the songs became the new healing. Thanks for listening to the latest episode of Scream Therapy. You can connect with me at soundcloud.com slash scream therapy. Thanks again for listening, and until next time, take care and be well. Amen.